Can you hear us? Oh, guys. Can you hear us okay? Is my what? You hear us okay. Oh, I hear you great. How are you? I'm good. How are you? We're super excited to have you. So sit back. We're going to do okay. our uh, formal introduction of you. Okay. That's like the, we're doing take two. <laughs> yeah, we're taking take two. the amazingly talented Pittsburgh born and bred Leo Ash Evans. He is an alumni of Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, he originated two off-Broadway roles, first in Finks by Joe Guilford and Jasper in Deadland by Hunter Foster and Ryan Scott Oliver. Leo has traveled the world working all over the United States in regional theaters, and he also performed in my favorite city, London. And his Broadway credits include Jesus Christ, Superstar, Shuffle Along, and School of Rock. One of his proudest moments was playing the MC in Cabaret. Welcome in. Bienvenue. And he won a Best Actor from Houston Excellence Awards. Leo also teaches. He is in his 10th year with the Musical Theater College Auditions. And he is now an assistant director and co-director, co-owner of the team. He helps young artists find the right program, the right match for them as they travel um, forward in their education as artists and coaching them to trust their instincts. Ladies and gentlemen, that's just a small little preview of our amazing guest today. Ladies and gentlemen, Leo! Oh. <laughs> oh my God, that intro. I need you guys to do that every day for me. We do. Actually, we're gonna call you every morning and leave that on your, on your answering machine. Yeah. Um, I so we do this introduction because we share these interviews with our students and we want them to have like a little background of who the person is, where they come from. And um, the first question we want to ask you is, where are you calling from and how are you doing? I am calling you from New York City. This is my new condo that I bought in this crazy pandemic. I bought a, a, a condo. I'm, I'm, I, I know, right? I know. I love it. I love it. Yeah, I, I, it was crazy. I had actually been shopping for it before the pandemic, and then it didn't look like it was going to happen, but then it still happened. So I'm calling you from New York City. Um, I'm uh, in Washington Heights, 116th between Frederick Douglass and Harlem. Or what? I'm in Harlem between 116th and Frederick Douglass. Fantastic. Awesome. Yeah. So tell us how you've been doing since the pandemic started and what are you doing to stay creative and stay inspired as an artist? I, yes. I mean, I, I'm very fortunate that I've always had my work with the coaching team that I am a director and owner of, as you guys said in that wonderful intro. Um, so I've been so busy and I've, I've, you know, successfully pivoted, you know, the word that we all use these days. Um, it's been hard. It's been really exhausting, of course, mentally, and then just, you know, personally, because I've, I've just managed to stay healthy. Thankfully, that's been, of course, the most important goal. So um, I'm grateful that I've had my health through all of this. But it's been, yeah, it's been really taxing to kind of in, embark upon a year, which you just don't really have answers since it's uncharted territory. And, um, you know, I'm just grateful. I mean, the students in about a month of my work with them, I quickly realized I needed to stop talking about Zoom and I needed to stop talking about online and virtual because they were looking at me like, Leo, I'm ready to learn and go to college. So I'm good with it. Like, we, I know it's not the same, but I'm ready to learn. I wanna, I wanna go to college. I wanna make this my living. So I quickly pivoted myself and went, Leo, I think you're having more of an issue than your students because I knew years and years of this. So. It's, it's interesting, it's, it, pretty quickly, they really were helping me as much as I was helping them, I think. Um, so they've been like my lifeblood in a lot of ways, more than they even know. I think we can definitely attest to that. I think yeah. we can agree with that. Did you stay in New York City the whole pandemic? I was, I, I, I was at the very top of it, I had been doing a production of Ragtime. I had booked Tate, which was like my dream role, Chris. I was so like, ah, oh, of course that one I lose. It was, a, it was like a week and a half in and it got canceled. I was doing it out West. And then I came back to New York and a lot of people said that to me, like, are you sure you want to stay there? 
for me, if I left New York, I think I would have been more anxious because I would have left my home. And since this is my home, it, it did give me comfort to feel like I was here since it's home. Yeah, I get that. I know yeah. a lot of people that, a lot of actors in New York were like, we're going back to our parents' house. You know, there was yeah. a lot of that. But I get that. I get wanting to stay in your in your little nucleus where you feel safe, totally. Um, you'll play the role again, don't worry. Uh, well, what's great is that Theater Works already said it's on the map for 2022 in the spring. So I'm just like, I'm like, I hope that happens. But I mean, why would it not? This thing is escalating so fast, this vaccine. I mean. Yes, yes, 100%. Okay, so we have so many questions, but you actually, I think you made us pivot to this question. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah. So can you tell us why did you turn to teaching um, as an artist? Because this is something that we are really familiar with. Uh, it's always interesting to hear people's stories, how they got into teaching. Yeah. You know, what other challenges have you faced in this last year teaching online and yeah. having to instruct students this way? Yeah. I got into teaching pretty quickly into my performing career because, because I got to go to Carnegie Mellon and receive such excellent training. I was working successfully pretty quickly and, and continuously, and I knew it was because of my training. I knew that... I had the foundation to support not only booking a show, but doing it eight shows a week. So I knew I knew that I was so grateful that I got to experience that. So it made me very passionate to wanna, you know, help teenagers pursue their dreams the way that I was able to. And, you know, I quickly found that my coaching, because when I first started off, I was just a monologue coach. And I, I quickly learned that through all of my monologue coaching, it was it was making me a better actor. And the acting was of course feeding my coaching. And right, it's like you were, yeah. it was fascinating, right? Yeah, I, it's fascinating to me because you know now through the pandemic when I see so many people go, well, I'm gonna teach. And I, and I kinda, I, it's interesting to me because I'm like, oh, are you gonna just? <laughs> you know? And because it's so something that it does take so many years and years and years of doing it to really feel, because I didn't call myself a teacher for years. I, I only said a coach. And I remember someone very wise said, no, Leo, you are an educator. You know, and I said, yeah, I guess I am, you know. So I've always done this juggling act, this, this multi-tiered faceted artistic career of my coaching, teaching, my performing. And then I got into voiceovers a lot into New York City in, in the middle of my time here too. So I, I kind of always just wear a lot of hats and um, I just, I like it that way. I, 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 I'm also a Libra. So like the balancing scale of me from a from an astrology standpoint so it also matches me in a lot of ways wait a minute i didn't even know this about you but i <laughs> this morning thought i'm gonna put on my aquarius pisces earrings because i bet leo is a, a little bit into astrology i literally didn't even know that about you well I, I i've always said i wish i had more time to know everyone else's i feel so selfish that i only know my own but I do, I mean, when people started to, to read me on, on, do you understand what a Libra is? And I was like, no, not really. It's October 4th. I know that's my birthday, you know? And then I learned and I, it did make sense because I'm indecisive about things in life. And a Libra is always a little bit of this and a little bit of that. So like when I have a little, a lot of my coaching, I'm really hungry for performing. When the performing is heavy, I'll be like, I got to get back to my kids. So I always feel that way. But I mean, it's funny. I'm sure you guys feel this way. The the thing I navigate with, with life right now and school, going to college, so many parents and students will approach me and say, well, I don't know. I mean, is this a good thing to do right now? And I said, a good thing to do. You couldn't be doing anything better. Go to school for four years while we're working through all of this mess. Yeah. It's a great time to be in school. This is really interesting because you know, our, uh, you know, I'm just like a year or two older than you. So, but our, our lives passed, but, but you started your training. Yeah. Correct me if I'm wrong. At the center. At the center. No, no I never did the center. I think what you're thinking of is I knew Judy Gelman and Lisa Finney from okay. when they started kids theater project, which was okay. PMT. PMT. Okay, yeah. So you. That was my beginning. That was your beginning, PMT. But it wasn't called that then. It was just Gargaro Productions. Gargaro Productions, right? Okay. I wasn't sure if like our worlds 
Yeah. So we, when, well, we did Christmas Carol together. Yeah, we did. Yeah, we yeah. did. We did, and and I did Christmas Carol once or twice at, at CLO too. But but I think we did it at, at uh, a lyrical Christmas. No, I never did a lyrical. I only oh. did the CLO's Christmas Carol. Well, then that's when we worked together. Okay. Well, what I want to know is because I mean I had Lisa as a teacher too. She was phenomenal. But what did you what did you start to gain from those early training before you went off? And I love that you mentioned how important your training was. But what started for you? at that age, that tender age that we both teach where, you know, middle school, high school, when you're still like getting your like confidence and your bearings, what do you think happened to you then? That's a great question. Uh, I think, of course, the, the actual technical training I was receiving was great. I didn't really have it anything, to, I didn't have anything to compare it to, but I just think instinctually I knew I was growing technically as a dancer, singer, and actor. So I thought everything that was provided to me was great. But I think the bigger thing was the continuity with other people that were disciplined in a way that I was. So I talk about this all the time with my students about, yes, I want you to look at curriculum and yes, compatibility, but what about the you know, the size of the people that you're with changes your experience. So I was fortunate enough that my peers at Gargaro were good. So it was inspiring to me to be around other people that were good too. So it wasn't like a, it wasn't like a, a one show kind of starring thing. It wasn't like, a, I, I didn't feel like a big fish. I felt like everyone around me was so inspiring. So, and, and I think, I think, you know, Gargaro was really good about teaching you know, professionalism and discipline. And I really appreciate, well, well, Ken, of course, is like, I mean, I forever, I'm so thankful for Ken. I, he was so warm and fun at the same time. Like, good for him. Like, good for him for being warm and fun while also saying there are rules, guys. Yeah. And here are rules. to, And if you don't fulfill them, you could be written up. And if you're written up, you could lose your job. I mean, there were things that I learned young. So I think that was a part of it. The, the stepping stone of like the training to the, being in equity shows, even though I was just this young teenager. I think um, you said something about the people that you were surrounded with. And I think probably that's why I, I forgot because a lot of the people that you work with were crossover people. In, in, in Pittsburgh, there's a lot of theater schools. There's a lot of get your feet wet and a lot of different things. But when you were surrounded by people that love to work, it makes you want to work harder, I think. That's and there awesome. is this domino effect that we talk about in our classes where, you know, we all are here to work together. And if, if one or two of you pull away, you're going to pull that momentum away from everybody. And yeah. um, I had a similar childhood growing up. I, I was surrounded by insanely talented people, you know, insanely talented. And it, and it made you like continue to want to elevate and, and work harder. But one thing we've struggled with with the pandemic is like kids don't want to turn their cameras on or they're now inhibited to share. And I keep wanting them to know that by being part of sharing, by being part of the unit, you just make yourself and the group stronger. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's really well said. I mean, I think that, you know, the, the class can only move at, at the pace of the most negative person in the, uh, you know, you can't move the class along if that gel and, and momentum isn't there. So yeah, I, I agree. And, and the struggle of it's, you know, when people say, oh, well, it's, it's the same or, or it's, it's not the same. I mean, this virtual stuff is, is not a replacement, but the alternative to not doing it is what? That's what I kind of bounce back with a lot. So what are you doing instead? Are you just sitting at home doing what? Because this is still what you love to do. And, you know, the reality is, I mean, I, I've been fascinated by how many coaches have beautifully, you know, made changes to their curriculum to speak to this forum of being, you know, in, in with a piece of plastic. And I, and I, and, it, and that's exciting to me. And I think, you know, of course, we know the areas that are permanently changed from this. I mean, I have, I just went in for the blacklist a month ago and my agents, when I went in for this guest feature for it, it was like a six liner really quick. And he said to me, Leo, I don't. I don't know if you'll ever go to the casting office for something like this again. 
because now the default setting is that every professional actor basically has a good setup. We know we have our ring lights, we have our solid wall, we have we know what we need to do. Now the default is it looks good. So producers can trust the fact that what we submit looks good. Versus before, they would want to spend the money to have a casting director call us into the office a long day of casting. I get on the subway. I mean, think of the time efficiency of all of that. So again, not to get off on a tangent there, but I think that's that's where so, so many changes from what we experience in this medium like we're doing today are positive changes. And I, t- I tell the kids like, yeah, it, learning to be comfortable with this platform is an investment in your future. Right. Learning to know, and and for you too, with your... You oh, know. no, yeah, I was going to say, I mean, for music, <laughs> certainly, we've moved into a phase where everybody has to have some kind of recording set up at home. Yeah. yeah. And if we're going to make music together, it's got to be emailed, and we're, it's changing hands, and I'm adding my part and sending it off to someone else. Yeah, yeah. And we're putting music together that way, and everybody's gear now has to sound good and and you have to have knowledge of recording techniques and it's it's moving yeah. i'm excited i feel like it's moving into another phase yes and it's it's and growing it, yeah it's growing and it did and it just it just fast forwarded it so fast i mean because things were i was already starting to do more self tapes as an actor and helping students with pre-screens that was something that was already growing and grow- so we were moving in this direction it just happened really fast it just it was like that, that band-aid was ripped off really quick um and that i think was the that's what's been so hard with this year is just the the expediency to it it on you know the acceleration of it all um but a lot of it is is good i mean i mean i know that we're gonna get i mean i'm sure you guys heard the news about broadway september 14th full capacity i mean we'll actually i'll see it when i believe it but 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 the but the the fact that the governor at least is saying like we're moving in that direction there's nothing beats live theater so I'm excited to get that back. Well, will you do you do you feel like you're going to get a call? Like, do you feel like will you go back to School of Rock or do you have other projects? I mean, we're kind of. We're I went School of Rock closed. That closed a year and a half ago, so that won't happen. I'm Although, wouldn't that be great if like a that went up to COVID brain there? <laughs> no, no, it's okay. Maybe it'll come back. Maybe it'll be a revival of School of Rock. <laughs> <laughs> but I know I, I have absolutely no idea what would be next. I mean, going into the season is just so weird. Like, is it mainly just the shows that were there that closed? I mean, I have ragtime in the spring of 2022. Um, but yeah, I'm just happy to know that we're just, here's the thing. I, I have a very positive mindset. I'm, I'm grateful that I get that from my parents. I'm so thankful that they raised me that way and that they come from good families that can have that. Po- I realize that my pers- I wake up with the glass half full, you know? So I know it, it might, it's easier for me to say that, you know, than some people that have not been healthy. They don't have employment. Um, but we are moving in the right direction. So to see that is is enough to get me excited. Well, here, here's what I want to know. Okay, As musicians, so this has been like an extended practice break for us. Um, we're at home. We're practicing. We're playing every day, hours a day. Um, it's it's <coughs> it's going to be relatively easy for us to jump back in to do what we were doing. I think there's going to be slight adjustment. What are you guys going to do the next time you're in a dance call or it's gonna be the whole process? Cry. Auditioning. Are you going to have to learn cry. how to audition all cry. over? Of, yeah, well, those no. Those kind I, of chops? Because you can't practice I, that. He's not, he's not going to. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer first. Okay. Because okay. a lot of times when I'm like sitting at home watching TV or like doing something else creative, he's like, shouldn't you be practicing your art? Well, for us, it's like... it. A lot of it is the muscle of being and listening to other people. Yeah. It's playing off of people. Oh, well, that's right, I right. that too. Right. But for us, it's like, you know, I can, I can absorb other material, but it is a little bit of a holding pattern. I mean, I haven't, I think you're absolutely right that there are sections of it that will feel rusty, rough, like, but I think most of it will come right back. I think it is like riding a bike. I mean, again, if you hadn't been doing it for a long time, you know, some of my friends who like got out of here, they were already whining and complaining before this pandemic. Like they were all ready to leave it. You know, that's what I said to one of them who was like, I just feel bad. I'm like, no, you don't like, it's time for you to go. But, but the, but the, the, a lot of us, I think 
I think it'll come back. I think we'll be in an audition and it'll feel so much like, you know, just so overly stimulating. Well, yeah. I mean, we did we did a gig, our first, well, my first in-person gig back, and I got all the way through it till the end and then this wave like of emotions came over me and I like was like pushing down, like starting to cry because it was like, oh my God, it, it is, it's so exciting that, and I think for a lot of actors, it's like a rebirth. It reminds us yeah. how lucky we are, you know. And, Im and important, how important the arts are and how important the message is. I mean, I've never gone a year without performing. I've never done that in my whole life. So that's, but it's, I, but I do have those unknowns where I'm like, what is this going to be when I, and I think it also depends the kind of show I'm doing, what role I'm playing, you know, that kind of thing. So um, I'm going to, I'm going to bring you back to the training and I want to know, and I, and I want r real talk, like, especially because for our students, you know, they look at you and they're like, oh my gosh, he's on Broadway. He's so successful. What are the life lessons you've learned from working nonstop in the business, the real life lessons about why people are hired, why people continue to work, because I think coming from you is going to have a lot of weight. Well, I am a really, I'm a team player. I'm, I'm, I'm someone who works really hard. So I always tell, this was, this was advice given to me and it's definitely true that in the beginning of your career, I was hustling my butt off. I mean, I was working my butt off. So I definitely earned my success. I tell what students- all that What does that mean what when you, mean, when you say hustle? That. Because I know yeah. what it means, he knows what it means, but it's, what is the down and dirty? Right, well, to me, I mean, I had a full like monogamous relationship with show business. I mean, almost to the degree where looking back, I wish I would have learned a little earlier, maybe also feed my life with those other things that I love that are not just theater. But in the beginning, through most of my twenties, it was, just hitting the pavement. I mean, I, ha I had an agent, which was uh, wonderful and a good blessing and, and, you know, super helpful for Team Leo, you know, as I started, but I was doing my own auditions too. So I was stacking the deck. I stayed active in classes. I kept up with voice lessons. I had a gym membership. I would go to Broadway Dance Center. Um, you know, Carnegie Mellon was great, but once the umbrella is gone and you don't have that structure, I had to create to the best of my ability things that I knew were important to me to keep keep up you know you have to you have to keep up your craft and keep up your your facility and um I did do that well and but I also was very business savvy so I was hungry I I wanted to learn what the business was I wanted to participate in it I didn't want to sit back and be a passive player I wanted to be assertive and get my get myself in the game and then I also like I'm a communicator I love talking to people so it was fun for me to get to know who are the casting directors that I'm auditioning for? What shows are opening on Broadway in the fall that maybe I should go learn about or research or go to the library and read up on, I don't know, Lerner Lowe, like I know Rodgers and Hammerstein. So let me read up. So it's like you, when I was young, I was still letting myself learn. I think that's why I've been successful, but it's also a positive mindset. I mean, you know, I don't, it's hard because show business has a lot of jaded, angry, bitter people. And I do believe that you have to find your circle of people. If you're, if you are surrounded by people that have nothing but negative things to say, then like it will pull you down. So there have been shows of mine that have not been that enjoyable. And that is because unfortunately there were more sour grapes in the cast um, than positive ones or not, or what's a, what's the opposite of a sour grape, a healthy apple. Juicy. Apple. <laughs> a luscious apple. I don't know. Um, but you know what I'm getting at. Um, yeah, I, I think that's why I was I was successful. But you got to know your business. You know, you got to know the business you're competing in. So, you know, when I started, there was no social media. Internet was just kind of starting, but like it was still like call your voice service to get your agents' messages. So it was it was different then, and and it didn't. There was no there was no instant gratification. So I think sometimes the current students that I work with, they're so used to clicking buttons to getting things that they don't realize how long it takes to become good at what you do. Um, and it feels like the light bulb goes off, but it, it's not a light bulb going off. You have to keep at it. Okay, before, because you just gave the best segue to the one question, but um, one thing I want to ask you, yeah, is as I listen to you and, I, and I'm deciphering for my students, so being resourceful, being self-disciplined, 
and knowing that you're always continually learning. But something that I sort of also piece together for them is to remind them jobs don't just come to you. You, when you talk about hustling, you mention continuing to take dance classes, continuing to find auditions on your own. That, I mean, that is part of what we try to prepare our kids to understand that, you know, jobs, you're not going to leave your education and someone's going to call you up and say, we'd love for you to come in and read for this. Yeah. You have to be proactive yeah. to find the work. Yeah. Whether that's reading the trade papers, you know, going to every odd open call, but constantly putting yourself out there. That's right. Um, and, and that makes us transition into this question even more powerful. Go ahead. Um, well, let's talk about your Pittsburgh connections <laughs> early on. How did your training start? And what did you learn uh, that you can remember from the early years when you really started out? Uh, learning about the craft. You mean like a kid kid? Yeah. I was in a thing called Kids on Broadway in fourth grade. And then that made me love it. And then I was in a troupe called the North Star Kids, which I hear gone now. They don't exist anymore. Annie Snyder was a miss. She was like my first teacher. I, I talk to her sometimes on Facebook. But um, I did that from like fifth to eighth grade and it was amazing. We would like perform on the Gateway Clipper and like all, we would go to nursing homes and and what was Three River Stadium. I mean, we would do like all of those fun things and we'd do like a Broadway review and I loved it. It was so much fun. It wasn't like hard training. It wasn't acting, singing and dancing. I mean, it was those things, but we were just in a review kind of format. And then I think it was in my late middle school days that I booked Peter Pan. I was twin two with Gargaro. And when that happened, and I was on what was the Fulton, not the Biome, but the Fulton stage, was amazing. And that just, at, at that was the birth of like, and you know, everyone else in the show were like professional equity actors that I was like, whoa, you can do this for a living? I wanna do this. Okay. You know, and then I dropped soccer and swimming and I, all I did at high school then was, was perform. And I was really late. Where did you go to high school? North Allegheny. I was at North Allegheny. Um, I did choir. So I was in the show choir. Um, that was really fun. We would compete every year. I love choir. I miss that. Um, and then, yeah. And then I didn't do the high school musical a lot because I was always doing shows with Gargaro. Yeah. And they were all like, like, they thought I was a little like too good for it, which I kind of was. I was. A That's Gargaro. actually sort of the similar <laughs> with me. I didn't really do my high school musicals because I was so invested in my theater school doing yeah. their shows so i get that um, yeah I mean, it's it's i feel bad but i mean like ken was giving me professional opportunities not i did do matt and the fantastics one year so that was fun did you must have played some of the shows leo did yeah you? i wonder if we did any <laughs> so i started working for gargaro when i was 18 years old in 1992 um and i played with i, I stayed i played most of his shows up until about 97 and then I went on the road for a few years and then I started working for him again in 01 when I came off of the road. But I bet you're right then because all of my main years with him were like 94 to 98. I'm sure I'm sure we did something Oh, that's so cool. Something to get Did you name a show? Name a show you can think of from maybe yeah, 90 Okay, what did I do? I mean, Peter Pan, Big River, Jesus Christ Superstar many times. Avita, oh yeah. Well, times. we both, yes. <laughs> Godspell. Yeah. I'm, I'm not sure I did Godspell with Ken until after 2000. Wait a minute, what did you do? You did Superstar or Evita? I did Evita, I did Superstar, I did Annie. That was, Annie was the first musical I did where I told him I can play acoustic bass. And he was like, really? Um, I did uh, West Side Story, he did several times. I did West Side, yeah. Did you do it in, no, I didn't do it in 98. I did it in um, like 2000, you already got it. I think you both remember the years you did shows. I, that's how I remember. I can't, I, you could drop me a year. I can, I have no. I can tell you shows by years. Yeah, I know that's weird, isn't it? But wait, you're a Vita. Who was, um, was Ron Wisniewski? Um, yes, or, uh, yes. I remember when Ron. So that we were in it together. I'm confused. <laughs> he was playing in the pit. I was in the pit. I, and I don't remember, but I should have known. Like, I mean, I was young, but then we did it together. Yeah. At that time, I think it was still the Fulton. Yeah, yeah right? I think it was. Yes, yes. Yeah. When you think back on those days, when you're like first starting out and you're and you're working alongside professionals, 
which it sounds like you really took seriously. You were super excited. Is there something you go back in time to say to that younger self about that experience or about what was is to come? Oh, I love that question. I mean, what would I say to that young Leo in it? Yeah. Hmm. No one's ever asked me that, Chris. That's a good question. What would I say to that self? I mean, I love it. Well, what would I say? Maybe engage more with those professionals. Maybe I think I was a little too, I looked up at them like I, they wouldn't want to talk to me. So I would look at Ron and I would look at Maria Baycoats Bay. She was always in all those shows. And uh, who else did I really look up to? Tammy, Tammy um, Flodine, you know, oh, uh, uh, Renata and Tony. I used to always look up to them. I mean, these are people that I really looked up to and I would say hi to them. But I think now that I'm on the adult end, I, I, I would have, because I love talking to students as an adult, so maybe I would have, and they were totally probably available, but I made up in my head that they weren't. Oh yeah. I think that's really smart because for the age you're specifically talking about, I always say that to my students. I'm like, I'm here to help you. We're here to help you. You know, like this is this is what the arts do. We, we, we used to say, talking about it in jazz terms, like coming up, like helping, how did you phrase it? Well, it's uh, it's like a mentorship, and uh, the way you learn is uh, well, you pay your dues, but there, coming there's up, there's an oral tradition, and, and it's passed on. You you apprentice, yeah, you yeah. apprentice with the older musicians, and they teach you how to play. And I love that. I love working with. I love doing a show when there's kids, and you kind of take them by the hand, and you're like, see how that actor like came off book. That's like really good. Like I'll plant, <laughs> I'll plant the seed in their head, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, right. I love I remember, that. Do you remember um, Kurt Cerny passed away years ago? Yeah. Kurt, I remember, was in Peter Pan. He was a, a um, one of the pirates and Indians. Yeah. And I remember he did teach me a lot about, like, dance and working hard. And, you know, Leo, if the director says, come back to stage right away, come right back to stage. Not because I was, like, misbehaving, but he, he was taking me under his wing in a beautiful way. Oh, I have a great Kurt Cerny story. Um for years and years, I kept auditioning for West Virginia. I think it was something like, I'm not even exaggerating. I think I went 12 years and I never got hired. What? And he was always behind the table as like an associate choreographer or, you know, he was like in the mix. Yeah. And I went in another year and I, I, I sort of started to feel like I was just doing it to make myself depressed. Like, here I go, I'm showing up again. But as we've learned, there is no such thing as a wasted good audition. Right. And I remember coming in and he had like bumped up in the ranks. Kurt had bumped up. And he pulled me aside and he's like, you never stop. And this is your year. Don't stop coming. He's like, yeah. I see you every year. You come in. He's like don't stop and that little push for me leo it gets me emotional because he was a beautiful man that yeah. little push to to be seen yeah is what we try to do for our the, our students you know we try to do that for each other but he yeah. did that for me in a professional way that i you know like it meant everything to me you you were showing up you were participating you know that's the thing is that we get in our own way if you just show up and you kept going at it. I mean, that, it, there's, there's so many lessons to that. Yeah. I love that. It's so true. And he was such a, yeah, such a beautiful spirit. Yeah, he really was. And I think, I think that's great. I love that you go back and say engage more because I think that's something that yeah. for the age when ki most kids get the bu theater bug, they, you know, it's usually very young. It's usually like eight or nine or 10, right? And that's when you're super open and then you hit those preteen years and you pull back it's the truth it's a it's a really um it's like it to stay in the moment is hard you know you always want to race ahead and you're always trying to you don't think that where you are is enough and you're not accomplishing enough i mean i do appreciate that with gargaro because i wasn't like a lead role and i was in the ensemble it felt safe too and i like that 
and it also taught me community. You know, so so then when it was like my turn to break through as a principal actor, I was so hungry and ready. Yeah. You know, and I was trained, and I and I had the I had years of the fantasy building and having people that I looked up to. I mean, I sometimes I forget just how how powerful those Pittsburgh years were. I mean, I I went back in two thousand and. Uh, 16 from my cousin's wedding. He still lives there, but my parents don't live there anymore. They're in Florida now. And I, you know, I, I don't have the connections there family wise. I do have some, but not as, as many. And when I went back, I mean, it was like, it took my breath away. It was, I mean, it's, it's my home. <laughs> and you know what? You'll, you'll, it has this magic effect. You know, the theaters here will call you back, right? I mean, there's there's some really lovely theaters here in Pittsburgh. You're gonna get called back, and that that pull from Pittsburgh is gonna drag you out of the city. It will. It'll happen. Well, and Ken did call me back in twenty and twenty. I'm now I'm blanking on years. This was oh, this was earlier, like eight, two thousand eight or nine. It was about seven years after I graduated. I went back and I played Ren and Footloose for PMT, which was amazing. It was amazing. I loved it. It was fast. It was like, you know, we Yeah, we must have I must have done it. We must have did it. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I did that in I did that in like two thousand and like seven, eight, or maybe six, six or seven. I'm sure I did it. And in the same year, Pittsburgh CLO brought me in to play Will Parker. So I played Will Parker in Oklahoma and Red and Footloose in the same year. Oh my god, that's wow. fantastic. It was a great Pittsburgh year. Those are two great roles for you, but Will Parker, especially, I can see you were like exploding with joy. <laughs> like that, I can see that in a, in a- It's amazing to do, I, that writing is so good, that whole show. Why is being self-disciplined so important? Why is it, like, why do you have to keep the drive alive? You know why? Because this, this business is, is sloppy this business doesn't provide its own structure. So if you don't set your own self-discipline and structure, the, the, bus the business is not black and white. So it's not gonna provide you. If you do, if one, if I take this one and this one, that equals two, right? No, not in show business. So it's like, you have to find your own track and, and discipline within that track of what you wanna do. You can't wait for others. I mean, when I did Shuffle Along, I remember when I was doing all my research and I heard George C. Wolf say, um, don't wait for show business to come to you, to give you the permission to do what you want to do. You have to go out and get it. You have to go out and find it. Billy Porter talks about this all the time. Is George, of course, is such an inspiration to Billy. And Billy talks about that a lot, that, he'll, that he was inspired by George saying that. And, and now I'm, I'm right there with him. How fun I mean, was it? How, how, well, that's an amazing quote because that, that is... That's don't wait for the show business to give you the permission. Yeah. It, it's not it's not someone saying, yes, Chris will hire you. Yes, Leo will hire you. It's not that it's you have to go out. And I mean, I remember I had got I was up till um, the end for buyer and seller there for the standby, not for Michael Yuri, but but to stand by for Michael Yuri in buyer and seller. And I didn't get it. But I remember I had worked on because that's a one man show. Yeah. I had worked on the sides relentlessly. I had callbacks. I mean, I had learned a lot of the. And I remember I was so frustrated. And then one of my friends, who's not even in theater, he was like, well, can't you like rent one of those studios? And like, we'll all watch you do it. And I went, that is an excellent idea. Why do I have to wait for buyer and seller to hire me? Why doesn't Leo learn the rest of the show, rent out a studio Ripley Greer, put up, put up 25 folding chairs, get a pizza for everybody, it was amazing. I mean, that, it was like the best of it. And that's the example of don't wait. So that wasn't about the flashy main stage credit with costumes, Broadway credit. It doesn't have to be all those things. And then by doing that, of course, I was smart in who I invited. Of course, that got the word out of like, wow, Leo's great at this. Or And, you know, it, it that all leads. That's that whole showbiz story of one thing leads to another. Well, you know, it, I think it's also where we come from in Pittsburgh, that hustle. It, it comes from our yeah. training. It comes from where we grew up. And um, so this year with my kids, I told them they all had to write an original cabaret because I was teaching virtually and I spread it out over seven months. And I kept saying to the kids, this work that you're doing is making it happen for you, is, is putting right. out in the universe, showing people how talented you are, putting your best right. foot forward, you know? And so we... 
uh, that mentality of like, yeah, making it happen for yourself is, I think, at the heart of the best artists. The people that hustle and create art and make opportunities for themselves are the people that just thrive. Yeah, and you used the big word before, proactive. If there isn't something proactive in the way you go about this business, I, I just don't think there's that many people that sustain a career that way. You, just, you can't sustain a career if you're going to depend and wait for on others. You, you have to have that own voice within you. And then, of course, the, the hardest thing, I tell this to my students, you know, who, who were just finding out about where they got accepted to college and then, of course, where they were rejected, that we can't give people on the other end more power than is earned. So if, if someone on the other side says no, unfortunately, it's a no for now and literally only for now. And it's what you're going to do with that. No, you can, you can mourn it. I let my students be upset for 24 hours. And I said, after that, no more. Is that what you say too? I say, you can sit on the couch and eat ice cream for a whole day. Yep. And then after that, it's done. That's but it. you can give right. yourself a whole day. That's exactly what I say. I have a friend who does something that I think is great. I can't do it because I'm just Jewish and I can't wait. I can't do it. But he rips up his sides as soon as the audition's over. Oh, no, I can't do that. Well, right. Because I'm like, what if I get a callback? I'm going to have to reprint that paper. I am exactly with you. I'm not, and then, but this is the embarrassing thing, Chris. When I moved here to this new condo, the manila envelopes of sides and sides and sides. Sometimes it was the same show with the same, like a couple different Will Parkers. Leo, what are you saving? Well, no, no, no. I, I get it. I'm exactly the same way. I have like a, my little office is like an explosion of that stuff, but I'll find sides, which now I'm too old to play. And I'm like, I should probably hold on to this. <laughs> And then I'm like, wait a minute, I'm like, this is never going to happen, right? But I get that feeling of like... You justify it. You justify it. But yeah, I mean, that, that, yeah. I mean, I think that the, the, the ripping up is a great omen that it's just like, now it's over. He's done with it. Water under the bridge. Yeah. I think that's great. And I love that you say that to your kids because I say the same thing. Oh. And, and there really is something into... If I always say to the kids, if you really have given everything, if you've put everything into it, then the 24 hours is like, it's like mourning the work, right? It's like, it's like, you know, I, I'll spend hours and hours and days and days preparing for an audition. And then you walk in and you feel great and you don't get it. Saying to yourself for that next day is like, man, I'm sad that they didn't see how great I was, but I'm going to get over it. You know, I think there's something to that little process. You have to believe that you're the best. Yes. I do believe in, in every way, not in a narcissistic, of course there's other bests, but you have to believe that when you walk in the room, you are the one to book this role. I do believe that egotistically in a good, healthy way that when I go in, I do think I'm the best for the job. That, that, and that, you have to, it has to be earned. Like you got to do all the work to get to that place. But there is that place that I, when I read the sides or, and it's not every audition, but there's, you know, again, if you have good agents and you have a good sense of what you're right for, marketable, all that. If you read something and you're like, oh, I really want this. Then you've got to think selfishly, I'm the best for this. Yeah. You know, it's in a healthy way. In a healthy, a healthy way. way, right. Because then you also, when you are in the mindset that you're right for it, then that connection with the character is so much more seamless. When yes. you're confident and you've done your work, like you said, then it's like, boom, it, it, it fits. It's the people that are like, huh. Oh. When you, when you brought up MC, I mean the MC, I'm so, thank you for saying that because a lot of times people will just rattle off the Broadway shows. If you really ask me what is my favorite role today or experience today, it's not any of the Broadway shows. It's actually Cabaret. Well, and, and, and I did that role twice. And when I auditioned the first two, three times, I never booked it, but I kept getting so much better at it. That time that I booked it, I went after it. They wouldn't see me. They said, you're too young for the MC for this production, but we'll see you for Ernst. And I was like, all right. So I went in for Ernst and the, and the song that they asked you to sing was a candor and ebb song. So I was like, well, I'm gonna sing the opening. And after I did it, the director said, 
wait, you have the sides for Ernst? And I said, yeah. And he said, I need you to look at the MC. Can you come back and read for the MC? And I was like, yeah, sure, I can do that. You know, so I did it. Yeah, I did it. It was my idea. The casting director said, no, he's too young. I always think in moments like that, the casting must think that's so, like, this is weird, you know? But No, but you, you, you do back. what I say to my kids, leap and the net will appear. Yes. So you left. You said, I know I'm right for this. I know that I can right. do this. So I'm going to leap anyway. And I'm going to leap. It wasn't disrespectful. You still had prepared what they had asked, which is essential. But you also left and you said, I'm going to show this side of me too. That is like yeah. genius. Yeah, it's exactly right. And and then you leap and you have to trust that there are people on the other side that, that sync with you. Yeah. And then he did. This guy didn't know me. He was like, who's this Leo guy? You know, and there were other people in that hallway that had much bigger credits than I did. You know, and I remember the monitor, who is a great equity, he, he's amazing. He said to me, he said something along the lines of, um, after I booked it, he saw me, he said, Leo, that was your day. That was your day. Which I thought was so great, because sometimes when I have a bad day, I'm like, it's not my day. It's just not my day today. This isn't my day. I think that's the but idea. that was my day. You 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 made me think of something. I'm sorry, we're kind of going no, it's off. All right. it's all right. This is um it's so important to do that for people. It's like what Kurt Cerny did for me. It's what the monitor did for you. You know, we are it is a competitive, sloppy. I love that you used that word. I think you said sloppy industry. But it's it's caring enough to know that the good we put out in the world comes back to us tenfold. That's right. And that moment, however many years ago it was that he said that to you, today was your day. That is like the little gem that you put in your box. That's right. Box of stuff that actors carry around. That's right. And you have to believe that then it can be your day again. And you, and you know, it's that whole thing of like people who don't believe in luck or they do believe in luck and that it's all around you. It's, are you there to grab it? All of that. I, I subscribe to that for sure. Yeah. So it's even like today, like when that announcement was made about Broadway coming back full capacity, I had a lot of friends that were like, well, I don't know. I mean, we'll see what the unions say. We'll see what's, and all of that is true. All the skepticism or the fear I, I get, but it's like, you got to first look at it and go, you make a choice. Hey, this is a step in the right direction. It's just like anything with show business. Okay. I didn't get it, but what did I learn from this? What can I take with me to the next one? You know, I always try to tell students, what are you working on as far as what you want to do? Not once you see the breakdown for the show. I was already working on that MC stuff. Yes. You were investing in like the shows that you knew you were right for. Now, when you talk, when you're teaching kids, especially in the past, I'd say, I'm going to date myself, but I'm going to say in the past seven years that the explosion with the obsession with fame on social media. I mean, maybe I've just, I've just picked a number out of thin air. Do you encounter that with your students wanting that use of social media to be what springboards them? Do you Catapults them. I don't come across too many students that it's more important to them to do the social media than the training, which I'm grateful for. I do, because the, the main kids I work with are like the sophomores, juniors, sometimes freshmen, but sophomores, juniors in high school, they know about it. Some of them, like I had worked with a, a female this year that is a big, you know, uh, TikTok sensation, but she also still did want to do the work. So I do find that the balance is usually there, but I, I, I actually feel more of it is, is with, the 20 year olds out of college that seem to think, you know, they don't sustain or keep up with doing more of their training. So they think that the answer is just the amount of followers. And, you know, look, there is a, there is a part of the business that that is true for. There are certain projects and certain companies that really will look at the amount of followers that people have. That is true, but it isn't all of show business. Um, so it's tricky. It is. And that can't be in place of, I will say this though, there are people that I think are brilliant at their artistic skill sets in what they can edit. They're, they're basically storyboarding their own thing. And if they can storyboard themselves and they're showing editing skills, you're t it's like a little mini one woman, one man show. And that's kind of brilliant. So I will say there are some people that if they get the right balance with social media, it's actually 
it's actually providing them the opportunities that I was saying for, which was don't wait for the show business to come to you. Don't give permission. You can create your work on social. So if your thing is silly improv and you're making up characters or voices, or if your thing is dance and you're always improvising uh, dance routines, if your thing is singing and you're singing in the staircase, my ex, he, he's been he's been um, singing songs in a staircase in his building, and now it's taking off. Is like do staircase, Michael, do it, do it, and he's singing all of his stuff, and it's kind of brilliant because he found a quiet place. Of course, the reverberation's amazing, yeah, yeah. and it's so it's like, and so you have to so if you use it that way, social media is great because then you actually are a commercial of yourself. So you know, I was ahead. just gonna say it's completely changed music for me. Yeah. It's completely changed music. I'm dealing with students now who are 16 years old and they're not discovering music from recordings anymore. They're discovering people online. Yeah. And even yeah. lessons they're learning. They're not studying with anybody. Yeah. They're 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 tuning in to people's channels. They're getting most of their information from YouTube and Instagram and TikTok. Much in the same way, we're in an age right now where people get their news from like their Facebook feed <laughs> when someone else shares a news article. But there's a danger but, in that. Oh, totally. Yeah. But the kids aren't. It's it it was it was the reason I got into social media because I wanted to be heard, and I thought I would have more credibility if I set up a channel and I started to teach online that it, I that young people it would reach them more. Yeah than it had in the past. But, but it had a, well, let me interject, it had a wonderful effect. So when he started his YouTube, people were like, I want to study with you. Which is what well, we the, want. Well, we want them not, to want not to Not so learn. much, well, people were, so uh, my boss at WVU, when he would recruit a bass player from Florida, he would mention me, and then the kid would say, oh, I've seen his YouTube videos. Yeah. So it started to, to help that out, but I mean, my point is the culture has done this huge shift. I think when you were growing up, you knew who Ethel Merman was, you knew who Mary Martin was, you, you knew who all these people were, and, and kids are getting things from YouTube now. Um, they don't yeah. they don't necessarily know who John Coltrane is, but they know who this this YouTuber who has two million Sample subs, to, yeah. and he's teaching me about, you know, it's, it's just totally shifted. Yeah, yeah. No, it's true. I mean, and that that idea of how you utilize social media can be an amazing tool, you know, because now, of course, the casting directors are finding people on social media channels. So if you are smart in the way you curate your page or your channel, it is like it it has replaced websites, not replaced in the sense that you don't you shouldn't have a website, but the go to is not a website. So, some directors I know of will say, I still go to a website. I still but that's because they're more old school, yeah. but like a fresh young casting director in New York City, they are going to your Instagram page. They are going to your Facebook page. It's just, you know, so again, it's not, not and I don't think you have to have a ton of performing on it. I'm behind that way. I've, I've been slow to the curve of that stuff because again, all of my twenties, no, there was no Instagram. I mean, Facebook happened in like 2006. So I was like 26, you know, 27. It's, it's hard. It, it, you, you only can do what you feel comfortable doing. You've got to be authentically yourself. So if you do start to dabble in stuff that you think you should be doing, and then it's not you, like, ooh, everyone can tell. Nobody wants to be on your page, you know. That is right there. That's the morsel. That's the great morsel that you gave us to always be authentically yourself and not try to be something you're not because you are right. enough. I love that. And that's one of the things that drew me into wanting to interview when I sort of, sort of surf, surf, that's the wrong, what's the word? <laughs> when you're like researching you people on the internet. Yeah, yeah, you surf, oh. you Google. You Google. Google. Uh, yeah. It's like, I read that about you. You know how that on your page you were like, I want to teach people to trust their instincts, to trust. And I think that's a great way to land this interview is because ultimately you've booked your work and you've been successful because you've been true to who you are. You know, yeah. you've been true to who you are. You've been confident. You've done your work. And if there's like any way to wrap up, like for, 
What? No. F- what about the fun question? Oh, oh yeah, we need to. Ask we have to. Well, have wait, the fun I want to wrap up this moment because I feel okay. like he gave a great. Like you guys are such a good duo. You're so good together. We kill each other every day. Uh, <laughs> what? What do you think? What do you think? Um, are the like the best lessons that you would tell a kid who's who wants to consider this as a, as a career? The down and dirty like facts that you would like land this with. Yeah. I mean, I do remember that Jordan Thaler, who's a great casting director here in New York City, came to Carnegie Mellon senior year, did a master class with all of us and said, listen, students, I know all of you have all the talent in the world to book many, many wonderful shows and you will, but you've got to find something else besides show business that you do enjoy doing for the bad rough days. And I remember in my arrogance thinking, oh, I'm a senior at Carnegie Mellon. I don't need any of that. You know, and thinking I'm not gonna need that stuff. And I remember that first bad day and I was really upset. And I remember J- Jordan like was flashing my, in my head. And I, when I see him, I tell him that I still share this all the time. And I always have had a huge plant hobby. I'm a big green thumb. There are plants all over this apartment. So when I'm having a bad day and I got this from my parents, my parents were both gardeners, green thumbs. But that is a great thing that feels good to invest my time in. So while I do want everyone to work their butts off when they're first starting, I do think it is healthy to have those other areas that bring you back to theater too, that kind of channel you back. Because if it's only theater, 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 I think for most people, you know, it's just, it's hard. The other little tidbit I'll share, Priscilla Lopez, who was the original Morales in Chorus Line, you know, um, she was doing a premiere play that I was in with her And Matthew Lopez, her nephew, who just wrote The Inheritance on Broadway, she, we were all sitting around, like, at the end of the week, we all went and got a glass of wine. And she said, let me tell you guys something. And we were all like, yes, Priscilla, you know, because we were all like, exactly, Chris, exactly. And she was like, just know that is for, for all the hard work that you put into show business, it never gives it all back to you. Oh. Yeah. So it's to counter hard work, meaning, and her point was, you can have a great day, you can be Tony nominated that year, you could have a hit show on Broadway, but it never gives back everything you've put in. And I think what was so powerful for me in that moment was, right, this isn't a person, this isn't a pet, this isn't even a plan. It's not, show business doesn't love me back the way it is a business. So it, what it taught me in that moment was, you know, coming from Priscilla, who of course we all just look up to and idolize, she recognized good years and bad years. But I think if you said to her, what are her greatest triumphs or or, or successes, she would talk about her family, she'd talk about her kids, she'd talk about her shows for sure, but that it isn't encompassing of only show business. And I think that if you start to learn that younger, it doesn't mean that you take your foot off the gas pedal, it doesn't mean that you're not working hard, but you have to find those other things that give you joy too. That is amazing. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just channeling my good people that gave it to me. Well, no, and that's exactly what we do. We keep yeah. passing it on. We keep passing yes. it on. And I, I, I got a little choked up while you were saying that because it does, it does take a lot out of you. Like, it I'm takes gonna, a lot out of you. Just hearing you say that reminded me that what a all-encompassing, you know, emotionally and physically exhausting career it is. And that finding the things that bring us joy and also feed our creative soul are just as important to find that balance. Right, it's just as important to life. And then it actually makes you better when you come back around to do the next gig. So after you've ripped up the sides or you've said, okay, I 24 hours of eating ice cream on the couch or whatever it is, you come back to it and it's okay. You know, that's where in a weird way, the pandemic, I mean, for some people, did you guys see that thing that went around about for some it's a drizzle, for others it's a thunderstorm and for uh, uh, others it's a typhoon. You know, everyone handles what this moment was differently. I love that because everyone, it's okay to say it's just a drizzle for you. That is okay. You know, you stay healthy, you have work or it's worse, you know. Um, you're amazing. You're amazing. So kind of sad that even though we kind of, you know, we have the Pittsburgh thing that that you live in New York City because I'd love to spend time with you on a daily basis. Oh. You're pretty amazing. I just, Chris, 
all I have memories of is us being really silly backstage. Like I have memories of, like you were that person with me. Like we would talk, we'd be silly, we had fun. I don't really like remember specifics. I'm kind of a goofball backstage, I won't lie. I know, I love that. I mean, I am too. That's kind of the best part. That's, I mean, no, performing's amazing, but some of the most cherished moments are always the insanity. Backstage. I just like, or or like, or- (laughs) That's what I can't- Go ahead. I can't wait for that. I can't wait for to be backstage again. That's gonna be the best feeling. It is, it's gonna be just like, yeah. Okay, so we're gonna do a hard pivot because we always do these questions at the end. Well, just we okay. One. Go ahead. We're do it. You can out ask. Go ahead. So, give me three TV shows that were absolute necessities during the lock- lockdown. That I definitely have the first one, hands down. Ozark. Do you guys know Ozark on Netflix? She can't, I can't do. She can't do violent. I, I'll uh, tell you. Isn't that the best though? I have so many theories for what I think is gonna happen in this final season, but that's for another time. Okay, I did love Bridgerton. Oh. I just watched Bridgerton. All is fine and well. Reggae Jean. Yeah, oh God, I can't handle him. He makes me, un- I'm like uncomfortable. He's so hot. <laughs> it's so, it may- he's gone though. Yeah, I heard he's done. Okay, I think they're I actually, I think they're in trouble. I think that's actually not good for them. But apparently it wasn't going to be about them anymore. Now it's another. It's a story, another story. Okay, what else? I would, what else, what else? Um, I'm sure there is an answer. What was the third TV show? I mean, I always like The Blacklist. I always like, you're going to laugh at me, The View. <laughs> <laughs> I watched The View with those four catty women. They're all catty. They're all like, not whoopee. But the other ones, they're all so silly. But I still watch it. What else though? I feel like there was another Netflix show that like- The Crown. Stranger Things, what? The Crown? I never got into The Crown. It's shocking. I know, I know. Shocking. Okay. Well, wait, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say that I found out that we have something really in common because one of- What? My, well, I mean, one of my TV he- heroes is one of your TV heroes. Oh my God, Carol Burnett. I love her. Now that I have all the Carol Burnett show. Yeah, I could watch that anytime. But for me, she is uh, like, I know that you got to meet her. I, I would have lost my mind. I probably just oh, would have fell on the floor in a puddle. She's so, oh, Chris, she and she's so, I've actually heard different stories about her, not positively. I, I have nothing but positive things to say, though. I mean, I she was we, amazing. I thought we should end with a little tribute to Carol and to you, because this is like my homage to you spending time with us. Paul's gonna do a little quick. This okay. is for you. You ready? Yeah. Um, no pressure, Paul. No pressure here. Ah, uh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> I'm so glad we've had this time together. It makes me feel that I belong. Seems we just get started, and before you know it, seems it's time for me to say so long. You, we end every episode exactly the same way. I love you. I love you. And we love. Yeah, you do that. And you do that every time. No, just for you. No, we we played Carol Burnett for you. Just for you. <laughs> I love that. Oh, that made my night. That was so good. That's so fulfilling. Thank you for that, Chris.